All right, everyone, I think we are right at six o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Good evening and welcome to Aletha Health's first community webinar. Tonight we're focusing on breast health and we appreciate you tuning in. My name is Lacey Kane and I'm the community outreach liaison for Aletha Health. I'm excited to introduce our fantastic panel, panel of speakers we have this evening. They each bring a different aspect and expertise to breast health. All things we should be thinking about all year round, not just during Breast Cancer Awareness Month. But before I introduce them, I do have a few housekeeping items. First, you will notice your video and microphone should be turned off. In order to keep us on schedule, we will use the chat feature located at the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to drop your questions in throughout the evening and we will address those at the end. We will do our very best to answer as many as possible. We know everyone is busy these days and we want to respect everyone's time. So we will be concluding the program at seven o'clock. We are recording tonight's program and we'll make that available on our website very soon. Without further ado, I would like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Kelly Rhodes Stark. Kelly Rhodes Stark is a radiation oncologist at Olathe Health Cancer Center. She is board certified in radiation oncology and internal medicine and brings almost 30 years of experience to Olathe Health's cancer program. Welcome, Dr. Rhodes Stark. I just want to start out tonight by saying that we appreciate you logging on. Certainly this is different than what we anticipated. This is our third year of having a breast health and a breast cancer awareness event in the month of October. We've previously held these at the Cancer Center and they were so successful that last year we said, wow, we're gonna have to branch out and move this to another area because we actually had to do two programs to accommodate everyone. But of course, in the midst of COVID, we could no longer have that in person. I do wanna say before we start, that I do encourage everyone to go and have their mammograms. It is safe to have your mammograms. If you've been avoiding this during COVID, please understand that all precautions are being taken and it's safe to have your mammograms. So I really encourage you to do that as well as to visit uh, your primary care physician, any other physicians that you've been delaying seeing because of worry of, of COVID. So all right, well, let's, let's move on, Lacey. So I am a radiation oncologist, but I'm not gonna talk about radiation oncology. I'm gonna talk about just breast cancer awareness and our risk factors. Is there anything that we can do to reduce these risks? Next slide. So a diagnosis of breast cancer can result in high anxiety for women, obviously is an extremely common diagnosis. So most women are either personally going to experience breast cancer or have a close relationship with someone else who has been diagnosed with breast cancer. So what do we need to know about breast cancer? What's the risk of you developing this disease? And can we modify these risks? Next slide. Oh, knowledge is power, all right. So first of all, let's talk about how common breast cancer is. I can't tell you how many patients I see over and over that say, oh, you know, I just wasn't getting my mammogram. I thought I could feel something. Well, that's not the way to go about things because as you can see, breast cancer is the most common cancer in women in the United States other than skin cancers. Uh, lung cancer, however, surpasses breast cancer as the leading cause of cancer deaths. So you can see in this graph here, the improvement in overall survival for each decade from 1970s through 2011. This will be updated in what's called SEER database um, anticipated in the next year or so for the, this last decade. But the good news is that survival has increased if you have a diagnosis of breast cancer significantly during this time period. So how common is breast cancer? Well, in 2020, SEER data estimated that among United States women, 
there's going to be about 275,000 new cases of invasive breast cancer. And in, when we say invasive breast cancer, that's the type that could travel to lymph nodes and to other parts of the body. There are also estimated to be about 45,000 cases of what's called ductal carcinoma in situ, or DCIS. That's a pre-invasive breast cancer, but that also needs to be treated so that it does not progress to invasive breast cancer. The median age diagnosis is 62, and currently the overall five-year survival, and this is for all comers, all different stages, but 90% overall survival at five years after a diagnosis of breast cancer. And the lifetime risk for the general female population is approaching 13%. So about one in every seven to eight women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. So what are our risk factors for breast cancer? Well, there are some factors that can increase the risk. There are some that can decrease the risk. And probably it's a combination of risk factors that ultimately lead to the development of breast cancer. So we're going to look at these risk factors. The most important risk factor for breast cancer is being female. And that's not anything that we can change. Men can get breast cancer, but it's about 100 times more common in females. Yeah, I apologize. These are coming in a little bit differently here, but so the other thing that we can't change is our age. And so, as I previously mentioned, the median age is about 62 right now for a diagnosis of breast cancer. And you can see again on this graph that as you're approaching your 60s, that is going to be the, the highest risk for being diagnosed with breast cancer. Next slide. Another factor that we can't readily change is our breast density. And Dr. Massengale, who is our breast fellowship trained radiologist who will speak later, will discuss this also. And so you can see the different densities here and she'll go through things. But when we age in particular, for many of us, our breasts will become more fatty replaced. And many times it's easier to detect small abnormalities on imaging as versus a very dense breast. And right now, women with dense, dense breasts are about four to five times more likely to be diagnosed with breast cancer, whether that's a factor of just the ability to detect these or not. Um, that I believe is, is uh, discussion. Uh, next slide. Another risk factor that we can't change is how long is our body exposed to estrogen? And so for women who have their menses, they begin their periods when they're very young and continue until later age, so it's that unopposed estrogen, higher estrogen levels, appears to be linked to an increased risk of breast cancer. Next slide. Now this is something that I do want to talk about. Although we cannot change our family history or our genetics, I'm excited about a new program here at Olathe Medical Center and it's um, headed up by our director, Dr. Craig Anderson, our breast surgeon, and Melanie Knight. And I'm going to have her information on the next slide to talk about family history, genetics, and I believe if we know our family history and we know our genetics and we can be appropriately followed, we're gonna find these breast cancers earlier and earlier and have even better outcomes. So a woman who has a first degree female, so that means mother, sister, or daughter who has been diagnosed with breast cancer, they have approximately two times higher risk of a diagnosis. And if you have more than one first degree female relative, you can have a three to four times higher risk of having a personal diagnosis of breast cancer. 
Now, most women that are diagnosed with breast cancer, when we do genetic testing and screening, it's only about five to 10% of these women have the breast cancer gene mutations that we're all aware of, uh, in which women have uh, bilateral mastectomies and hysterectomies with oophorectomies, et cetera. So it's a small percentage of those women. However, we're learning more and more, and I'm sure that we're going to discover over the years why some women have a higher risk, and we see this in, in um, family members, and yet they don't have what's called a BRCA1-2 genetic mutation. I have a list there of some different genetic mutations that you need to be screened. If you've had a personal history of breast cancer, if you're less than 50, if you have more than one of those first degree relatives, a female relative who was also diagnosed at an early age or any male relative at any age or a family history of ovarian cancer. Those are the top ones that we think of when we talk about genetic testing, uh, but there are many others. Okay, next slide. And this is what I was referring to um, on that last slide, is that if you know your family history, that knowledge you can use to direct your health care. So Melanie Knight, this is the number that you can reach Melanie, and she is now running the High Risk Breast Clinic at Olathe Health. We're super excited. She's getting very busy about this. And uh, also, there's gonna be a new screening program at the time of your mammograms beginning soon at Olathe, and this can start the process. When you come for a screening mammogram, if you choose, you'll be able to fill out uh, information that then would trigger Melanie or Dr. Massengale, hey, this, this person has a family history. Maybe we should be uh, discussing, uh, evaluating this patient in the high-risk breast clinic. Um, and I really believe that prevention is gonna be the future of breast cancer. Genetics and therapeutics, which we are seeing in a lot of other cancers are leading the way. And so I, I think as the years go by, hopefully we'll be finding patients that would be at risk for breast cancer and being treating that without ever developing that breast cancer diagnosis. Next slide. Some other things that we can change, healthy lifestyle choices. We say this for everything. I know this is our least favorite discussion. <laughs> Next slide. So healthy lifestyle choices may help lower your risk of different types of cancers uh, and other health conditions, heart disease, diabetes, osteoporosis. So as in every discussion that you have with your primary care physicians, regular exercise, healthy weight, healthy diets your, that are high in your um, grains, fruits, vegetables, try to limit your, your bad fats and your red meat. And then also, for women when they're going through menopause, really trying to minimize the duration of what we call hormone replacement therapy or even eliminating that at all if their um, symptoms from menopause are not uh, just too burdensome and impairing their quality of life. All right, and that's it, that's my uh, my bored dog, so hopefully you're not quite as bored as that. All right, thank you, Lacey. Thank you, Dr. Ruth Stark, for that information. Our next speaker this evening is Dr. Jennifer Massengale. She is our board-certified radiologist who specializes in uh, breast imaging. Thank you for joining us this evening, Dr. Massengale. Thank you. Thank you all for uh, tuning in tonight and learning more about breast health and things that are all very important to us and important to women uh, in our lives. Next slide. So uh, this evening, we're going to just talk a little bit about the radiology aspects, the mammography. So as a radiologist, I'm the one that reads 
uh, the images that the technologist takes after you have your mammogram. And uh, we're gonna talk a little more about the 3D mammogram and why that's the best type of mammogram to get. Um, the 3D mammogram helps us find things smaller, earlier when um, treatment is easier. Next slide. So uh, early detection, that's what it's all about. We've all heard that uh, the phrase early detection saves lives. And, you know, I think it's, it's very true. Um, you know, studies have shown that mammograms can show um, an abnormality in the breast up to two years before you might even feel that lump or that mass in the breast. Um, so finding it sooner, finding it smaller um, is easier for the surgeon like Dr. Anderson to go in and remove that cancer in what's called a lumpectomy where he can conserve the breast. And then it often will prevent the need for more treatments like chemotherapy and, and so forth. So the key is to finding it sooner. So just some facts about mammography. You know, Dr. Rhodes Starks told us that, you know, so many are, are still being diagnosed every year. We have about 40,000 dying annually of breast cancer. But overall, studies have shown getting that yearly screening mammogram does decrease uh, the mortality rate in the United States and um, at least a third uh, since the 90s. We know that one in six breast cancers are gonna occur in women in their 40s. And um, in 60 year olds, our risk factor is one in 29 uh, women will be diagnosed. So we know that uh, starting screening mammography by the age of 40 and then routinely imaging every year after that um, definitely uh, saves more lives. So we, we strongly encourage women to come in by age 40 and continue every year. So the other important factor is who's reading your mammogram. Um, studies have shown that it is important um, to have a dedicated breast imager, uh, someone that reads 80% or more mammography. So as a general radiologist, I was trained to read brain and uh, brain uh, MRIs and um, abdominal CTs of the, of the abdominal organs, but I specialized in, uh, did a fellowship in breast imaging, so that's all that I read. So studies show that's going to give you a more accurate reading. So we know for about every thousand screening mammograms that are read, about 100 are recalled for additional imaging pictures. We may see something or we do see something, we need to bring you back for some um, extra views or an ultrasound. About 20 are gonna get a needle biopsy and about four cases of breast cancer will be found. So um, go next. So this is the old way we used to read mammograms. This is when some of you watching may have experienced this. You'd had the mammogram taken and then the technologist had to like develop the the image and it had to print off and then she would bring it to the radiologist on this big alternator. And that's how we would uh, read this film screen mammography. But now uh, we have uh, 3D mammograms. We'll go to the next. It's very hard to see those. So here on the top image, those are two views, uh, one of the right breast and left breast, the side views of the top, that old analog technique. And then on the bottom, we can see so much more detail. Um, uh, of these same breasts. Um, we'll talk a little bit about that breast density. That white part on the mammogram is that dense glandular tissue and the darker areas are the fatty tissue uh, that's interspersed to make up the breast tissue. But we can see so much more detail on our new um, digital technique. So here we'll get into a little bit more about tissue types. So we have four different breasts up here. The breast on the far left, that's considered a very fatty replaced breast. Many postmenopausal women are in this category. They don't have uh, the hormones circulating around acting on that dense glandular tissue. So it just kind of involutes. And, and this mammogram is very easy to read compared to the one on the far right. It has a lot of really dense tissue. This may be say like a woman in her 40s, a premenopausal woman on that far right. Um, she doesn't have uh, much fatty tissue. And then um, we have uh, in the middle there, uh, we have more scattered 
glandular tissue. And, and so it kind of goes from that fatty replaced up to that extremely dense tissue. So cancers and abnormalities on the mammogram are typically white. We live in a black and white, very gray kind of world. And so cancer is white. So you could see looking at that fatty replaced breast on the far left, if there was a white mass in the breast, we would be able to see it a lot better than that very dense tissue where that mass is hiding. 40% of women have dense breast tissue. Again, as we age, go through menopause, the majority of the breast tissue does uh, become more fatty release, but not always. Sometimes it's just a genetic factor. So the 3D mammogram is really good for all breast types, but especially for women that have that really dense breast tissue. Because again, remember that dense white tissue and the abnormality on the mammogram of that mass is going to be white, so it's going to hide in that dense tissue. So the tomosynthesis mammogram sweeps across uh, in an arc, um, x-raying the breast, and it's kind of like when I look at it, it's like looking at a book. If I had a book here in front of me, I can see the cover, see the front, the back. I know there are pages inside, but when I open up each page by page, that's when I can see the words on the pages. And that's what reading a 3D mammogram is like. I can kind of flip through each slice of the breast um, and it gives so much more detail and I can see if there's an abnormality hiding there. So here we have um, the traditional 2D mammogram image on the far left, and then we have some of these slices, uh, remember like going through our book, but the slices through the breast, and so the yellow square is highlighting a mass. Um, we can see it on that 2D mammogram, but really it is hiding in that dense tissue. But as we go slice by slice through that 3D mammogram, we can see it better. So this became uh, FDA approved in 2011. We're going to try to play a little video. I want you to look kind of at the top of this breast, which is actually the outer portion. This was a baseline mammogram. This was her first mammogram. Right in here, you can see that pulling or distortion. It's kind of hidden in that white tissue. And I've got much higher resolution monitors and I have all the lights off when I read. So um, I can see these things better, but um, this was hiding in this breast tissue. She was like 40, first time mammogram. I think she had one relative that had had breast cancer, but had never had a risk assessment. And that ended up being an invasive cancer. We'll go to the next slide. So is 3D a better test? Um, yes, so the 3D mammogram is shown to find 41% more invasive breast cancers. Um, it also significantly reduces callbacks. And what a callback is, uh, you have your screening mammogram and then you get the phone call that the radiologist sees an abnormality, you need to come back for additional pictures. So um, the 3D mammogram has also been shown uh, to be a better study and reduce the amount of imaging that a woman needs in addition to the screening. Here we have some nice pictures again. So in, in the little box uh, up in the corner there, you know, we see this area, is it just some of this white dense tissue? But when we go to those 3D images and we go slice by slice, we can see that there is an abnormality there. That's a tiny little cancer, maybe about the width of my fingertip on my index finger, maybe about a centimeter. And here we have uh, this, far left image, that is the 2D mammogram again. So that was the you know, traditional digital mammogram. This is a 51 year old woman. And uh, when we look at those 3D mammograms, we can see this uh, pulling almost like an asterisk or spokes on a bicycle wheel, this distortion. Um, so that's called architectural distortion. And that's what we can see in cancers as well. Here's another picture. So we have the 2D traditional mammogram on the left. Uh, and then we have kind of the blown up view of the, two, of the 3D slice where we see this mass with um, speculations, kind of has little finger-like projections extending from it. And more pictures. So as you can see, the 3D mammogram is, I mean, it's essential in my day. I would say that about 
um, 98 to 99% of our patients have the 3D mammogram. There's a couple in there that um, maybe their insurance doesn't um, cover it. Uh, Kansas passed a law that all commercial insurance payers must cover a 3D mammogram, so the majority are covered. And we have another picture. So this is kind of a zoomed in view on the left uh, of this side view of the mammogram. And we can see uh, this is a 2D image. So you, you can see kind of a bright white little dot there. That was a BB marker they placed on the breast because she had a palpable lump. So she was feeling this. Um, and then you can see a little cancer there um, on the 2D, but it's, it really blends in with the rest of that dense glandular tissue. When we do the 3D slice on that same little tiny cancer, now we can see more details. We can see those um, spicules or finger-like projections extending from that cancer, and that's another invasive cancer. So the manogram. Occasionally, we, uh, we do have men in our department, but um, we're just imaging their breast. So another uh, modality that Olathe Health brought to our breast imaging department was the 3D guided breast biopsy system. Um, it replaced a, an older table that women had to lie on to do the biopsy. And now it's upright. It's called a stereotactic biopsy. Um, it's a, a great system if you ever have to have a biopsy. But essentially, uh, a woman is seated in a chair for the procedure. She's awake. Um, the breast is compressed similar to a mammogram. And then um, we just uh, inject a little bit of numbing medicine. So there's a little pinch and burn. We made it make it teeny tiny little incision to insert our biopsy device through. It doesn't even require any stitches. And we take our samples. So we can do an easy biopsy in probably about 10 minutes of, um, of actual biopsy time. And this is uh, the device that we use for that biopsy. We can also do ultrasound guided needle biopsies as well, but um, you can see it uh, just kind of fits in my hand. It's nice and small and um, we make a little incision where we insert that needle device and we take our tissue samples and that's what those samples look like. They're little cores of tissue that we send off to pathology. Very easy procedure. So who should have a mammogram? Every woman starting at age 40 should be getting a mammogram every year. And uh, those women that are increased risk need to start mammography sooner. We're gonna talk a little bit about that um, later this evening. So how do you get a mammogram? If you're not having any problems, that's considered a screening mammogram, you can make an appointment, um, you can walk in. I would not suggest walking in this time of year. Everyone else is trying to get their mammograms too, so it could be a little bit longer wait, but just call or you can schedule online if you already are in our portal. We'll give you information there. Uh, but if you're a current patient, you can schedule online. Um, we do have extended hours pretty much all throughout the year on Mondays and Tuesdays. We do image into the early evening. And uh, currently we are imaging on Saturdays. So keep calm and get your mammogram. I do wanna reiterate what Dr. Red Stark said. It is safe. We are taking all the safety precautions that we can. Um, so it is safe to get your mammogram. Definitely something you don't wanna put off. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Massengill. Such great advancements in imaging and early detection. So thank you for sharing. Our next speakers are Dr. Craig Anderson and Melanie Knight. Uh, Dr. Anderson is a general surgeon who specializes in breast surgery. Melanie is our nurse practitioner who heads up the high-risk breast clinic at Olathe Health, which you are getting ready to learn more about. At this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Anderson to introduce you to that new program. Good evening. Hopefully this is our first and last virtual meeting like this. <laughs> so this, this is not necessarily a new program. We started this about a year and a half ago. Um, 
I was running the program, but the volume became such that I needed help. And I'm very excited to have Melanie join us. Um, next slide, please. So the purpose of the high risk uh, breast, cancer breast cancer clinic is to um, identify patients who are at increased risk for developing breast cancer. And this is somewhat based upon their family history, uh, potentially genetics and a personal history of any um, atypical uh, pathology on previous breast biopsies. Next slide. So as previously stated, there's about 275 uh, new breast cancer cases in the United States a year. So as an example as to how people, other people may be affected by this, uh, an example is if, if my wife were to get breast cancer, um, her mother would be potentially at increased risk, her two sisters would be potentially at increased risk, our two daughters would be at increased risk, as well as a, uh, a niece. So one person can have a pretty large effect on the potential health of uh, others. So we deem patients who are at high risk if they have a 20% uh, lifetime risk or greater of breast cancer. So what we do in the, um, in the breast cancer clinic is to do what's called a risk assessment. Uh, next. So the risk assessment is done through a program through the American Society of Breast Surgeons. This runs five different mathematical models. Um, no model is 100% accurate, but it gives you kind of a range as to what your risk would be. Uh, next slide, please. So in regards to your family history, the first is your family history, um, as we've gone through before, and whether you might have a history of Ashkenazi Jewish descent. Next slide. And then in regards to your hormonal history, we take into account your BMI, your onset of menses, your age of first childbirth, your age of menopause, whether you have a history of any hormone re replacement therapy, and whether when you've had your ovaries removed. And then from a histological standpoint, whether you've had any atypical breast biopsies in the past that would be considered high risk. So this uh, assessment generates a five and lifetime uh, risk of breast cancer. It also uh, generates a lifetime risk of ovarian cancer, as well as a probability whether you might have a mutation in one of the uh, breast cancer genes, the BRCA1 or BRCA2. So this is a professor at the University of Wisconsin. Um, so the models are intended to be useful um, but as he says, all models are wrong, but can be useful. Next, please. So what we do is try to identify those patients who are at high risk. If they do qualify for genetic testing, we can initiate that. We can offer a risk reduction strategy, which Dr. Rodestark has kind of gone over a little bit, and then create a personal uh, surveillance program that's a little bit more intense than uh, doing your yearly mammograms. The surveillance program oftentimes involves having you do your monthly self exam, have a physician breast exam twice a year, get your yearly mammogram, as well as doing a yearly MRI of the breast. And we try to stagger those uh, imaging studies every six months. And then if necessary, if a patient is identified to have a mutation in one of the breast cancer genes, then we can offer surgical intervention to try to minimize or eliminate that risk of developing breast cancer. So I can, if you'd like, I can have kind of Melanie kind of go through what happens uh, during an office visit kind of quickly, and then we can leave it for questions. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. So when patients come in to see me, we do the health history we answer the questions on the questionnaires to get the percentage of what risk you are for high risk. Anybody above 20% uh, would qualify to continue to see me every six months. At those appointments, we do a health history. We update family information and we do a breast exam. Um, after that, 
on that first exam, if you qualify to do genetic testing, we do it at that uh, appointment. After that, I see you over six months. It's really easy, uh, but it all begins with that first mammogram. Great, thank you both. Thank you all again for your time this evening and, and just sharing that information with us all. Um, it's, it's knowledge is power, as Dr. Rhodes Stark said. For those of you watching, please uh, drop your questions in the chat box. And like I said, we have plenty of time here to get through some of those. So would encourage you to uh, go ahead and share those with us so we can answer anything, whether it's it's been on your mind prior to tonight or anything you want a little more information on after our speakers have, have shared this evening. Dr. Massengale, I do have a question for you. Um, what do you foresee in the future in terms of advancements in breast imaging? Good question. So, you know, one thing that uh, we haven't really talked much about to, uh, this evening, but um, we do offer breast MRI and uh, breast MRI biopsy. Um, there is some new technology on the horizon out there with a faster MRI. So um, a lot of Melanie's patients and Dr. Anderson's patients will, that are high risk will need to be getting yearly breast MRIs. Uh, it's about a 45 minute exam. Um, and so out there at a lot of academic institutions, they are um, actively pursuing a, a faster, uh, shorter, maybe like a 15 minute breast MRI. Um, so I think that uh, is one thing that would be great in the future for, for high-risk women. And then we also do those that uh, have had a recent diagnosis will often need an MRI. Um, that's probably newer on the horizon, I'd say. Great. Thank you so much. Melanie or Dr. Anderson, I will let you two uh, fight over this one. But in regards to genetics, does it matter if your mother or father's side have a positive history of breast cancer? So we always start out with um, the questionnaire to see if you qualify for genetic studies. In regards to whether it's your mother or father's side, you still can qualify with how deep that history is on either side. So it, it's important, uh, it, it's really important both on your mother and father's side, say that you could have a, a very strong family history of breast cancer on your dad's side. Uh, there could actually be a mutation in one of the BRCA genes on your dad's side that he could actually inherit and he could pass it down to you. So um, it, it's, it's, it, each side is, is important, more so probably on the mother's side, but certainly on both. And I would also add, you know, there are other syndromes and such that it may not be breast cancer. It may be prostate cancer and pancreatic cancer and other things that could be on either side. So if you have questions about that, I would encourage you to uh, contact Melanie to, to see if you do qualify for evaluation. The genetic testing that we do, it, it actually looks at uh, about 32 different genes. Um, when we do that, we may not find a mutation in one of the breast cancer genes, but there's about two or three others that can increase your risk of developing breast cancer. And we found that also patients that are at uh, increased risk of developing colon cancer, uh, prostate cancer, uh, just a variety of things. Great. This is for Dr. Massengale or Melanie. I'll, I'll let you two uh, both address this, but can you share a little bit about a very key role we have here at Olathe Health in our breast nurse navigator and what she does for our patients who um, go down that track? 
I can comment on that. Um, so yes, so you know we have a nurse navigator, and um, when a woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, uh, typically she gets those results directly from her referring doctor. Um, and then the nurse navigator immediately gets involved to get the ball rolling. Um, Janet Mathiason is our nurse navigator who works very closely with Dr. Anderson. And she immediately telephones the patient, um, you know, just walks her through this new diagnosis and is there for her to, to get appointments for her with Dr. Anderson and, um, and kind of get that ball rolling early. Anyone else want to comment on that? I think that was perfect. Um, she'll help get facilitate all your appointments. Um, she has loads of information to help you through the process and is just a great book of knowledge to help anyone that has breast cancer. Great, thank you both so much. Please don't forget, go ahead and um, enter your questions that you might have for our panel in the chat box located either at the top or bottom of your screen, depending on where your um, task bar is. Happy to answer those. We do have time for a few more questions, so happy to answer those. Dr. Massingale. I could just comment on, um, you know, one thing that I think is so important important out there is the type of mammogram. We talked about the importance of 3D, but there are other 3D makers and Olathe Health um, here in the pavilion, Imaging Pavilion, and then at Miami um, County Medical Center, we have the Hologic Mammogram. It is the best mammogram in my opinion. I'm picky, um, but it, it does show the best studies for cancer detection. Um, and that's what we used across our health system. And it's not the same out there as there are other vendors and makers of that 3D mammogram. I would also say that uh, we're very lucky here at Olathe Health to have Dr. Massengale. She finds the smallest cancers that would normally be impossible to see. So, uh, you know, come here and Dr. Massengale will take really good care of you. Great. Thank you, Melanie. It does take a team, Dr. Massengale. Very true. Very true. Well, I will look to my panel. Do, do you all have any final comments you would like to leave our group with this evening? Get your mammogram. Get I think your, that's the pretty common theme this evening. Make sure you get that mammogram. And your breast exam by your primary care physician. And a monthly self-breast exam doesn't cost anything. Do your monthly and bring a friend. Uh, just to become breast aware, know what your natural lumps and bumps are. And if uh, something new or different pops up, then let your provider know. Great. Well, if we don't have any other comments from our panel, I want to just thank you all again, um, our, our panel speakers, for your time and um, sharing this information with us. It's all, uh, it's a great reminder for us to, to be uh, thinking about and keep top of mind. For those of you who tuned in this evening, we thank you. Again, this was our first community webinar, so we appreciate you um, tuning in and learning more about our information. Um, I would encourage you, if you don't have a primary care doctor, if you're um, not quite sure about scheduling your mammogram, visit us online at olathehealth.org. You'll be able to find a lot of information, not only about our providers, but about how to schedule your appointments, get connected with the patient portal where you can then schedule your appointments. Very, very simple to do. Thank you again and hope you all enjoy the rest of your evening.